online. Um, so thanks everybody for coming. Um, thank you very much for giving up your, uh, your time um, to be here today. Uh, we are going to be talking today about Egypt's silver pharaohs, um, which really means talking about um, one of my favourite discoveries from the history of archaeology in Egypt, the discovery of the royal tombs of Tanis, um, which uh, provided us with um, uh, a great plethora of splendid objects. One of the most splendid is the one that we're looking at here. Um, as we will see, this is a part of the solid silver coffin of Pharaoh Hekarkepere Shoshenk IIa. Um, but it's one of a, a number of um, fantastic objects, many of them made of solid silver, which, um, uh, which is um, where we come by this uh, name for this group of kings that were buried at Tanis, the, the so-called silver pharaohs. Um, so we're going to be talking about, um, about these splendid objects, but also the significance for this um, period of Egyptian history, um, specifically the 21st and 22nd um, dynasties, um, the early or the sort of first half of a period we call the third intermediate uh, period. So before we get on to that, by way of setting the scene, um, as I like to do um, chronologically, we're going to deal with the end of a much better known period. Third intermediate period um, begins with the end of the preceding New Kingdom, which comprises, as you will know, the 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties uh, of Manetho's history of Egypt. Um, this, uh, this period, 18th, 19th and 20th dynasties, the New Kingdom, so-called by Egyptologists, is one of the, the best known periods in Egyptian history. Um, it, uh, uh, it contains the reigns of a number of the best known uh, of Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, Tathmosis III, Hatshepsut, Amenhotep III, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, Seti I, Ramesses II. Um, these are some of the best known names from any period in Egyptian history. It was a time when Egypt's uh, empire was at its height. Uh, Egypt's um, king and country were in control of a larger um, territory beyond Egypt's own borders than at any other point uh, in Egyptian history. Um, and that meant um, Egypt was the most powerful um, nation, empire in the ancient world at, at this point. Um, and it was also able to draw on the resources coming from all of those conquered territories and peoples, all of whom were, were forced to pay tribute um, to Egypt. So vast quantities of resource of various different kinds, everything from stone, wood, precious materials, grain, et cetera, et cetera, um, skilled uh, craftsmen and others with, with talents pouring into to Egypt, uh, all to strengthen it and, uh, and make it uh, more and more. Um, powerful and secure in its position and um, the size of the empire sort of grew and waned and grew again at various times during the new kingdom but but generally speaking at least until um the middle of the 19th dynasty egypt was a was a, a very very powerful empire indeed um and as a result of this uh, there was a great abundance of material wealth um building and production of um of 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 material um, objects of various kinds, um, much of which um, has survived. And that, of course, means that um, the period is very well represented in the archaeological record. And that means that we know it um, perhaps better uh, than almost any other period in Egyptian history. In great contrast to the third intermediate period, which we're going to be looking at um, today, there, um, there was a gradual process of, I hesitate to use the word decline, um, but certainly change uh, in Egypt, um, particularly during the 20th dynasty. If we just go backwards um, one slide, if I can do that. Um, this is the period during which um, every king bar one um, took the name Ramesses following Ramesses II. Ramesses the Great, so 
to memorize the names of the kings of the 20th dynasty, you need to remember Sethnacht, the first king in the sequence, and then that there were nine kings taking the name Ramesses following him. Um, all of them um, are hoping to emulate the great Ramesses II, the great builder, the king of the longest reign we know of, uh, pretty much in Egyptian history, king with numerous wives, many, many children, um, perhaps, perhaps the greatest builder, or certainly between monuments he constructed in his own name and also monuments he usurped, um, his, his mark on the landscape, the built landscape in Egypt was perhaps greater than any other king. Um, and he casts a shadow over the remainder of the period. It's, it's clear that, um, um, that these kings were trying to, to emulate him and to be as great as him. One of them, Ramesses IV, even leaves an ins inscription that, that makes that fairly clear. But of course, none of them could quite um, match his achievements. And in fact, the 20th dynasty is this time of, again, I hesitate to say decline, but certainly change. I mean, it's a bit difficult to avoid the idea of a of a, a of a, the idea of decline, a sort of slide from this great pinnacle of of achievement um, in terms of power and wealth and empire. Um, and we begin to see the clues um, of this in uh, as early as the time of Ramesses the third, the second king of the twentieth dynasty. And this papyrus, um, a, a sort of grainy apologies for that image you see on the right hand side. Um, this is known as the Turin Strike Papyrus. It's now in the Museo Egizio um, in Turin. And a part of it apparently describes um, the first industrial action, the first strike in history. And this is the relevant passage. It reads, year 29, second month of winter, day 10. That's of the reign of Ramesses III. On this day, the crew passed the five guard posts of the tomb saying, we are hungry for 18 days have already elapsed in this month. And they sat down at the rear of the temple of Menkepera. And the temple of Menkepera is the small temple of Ammon, which sits um, a little way to the eastern north of the temple of Ramses III um, within the temple enclosure of um, Medina Habu. Uh, so that small Ammon temple is actually the, the cult centre of the god Ammon on the, on the West Bank. It's not itself one of the memorial temples or mortuary temples connected with a funerary cult of a king. It is a, it is a cult temple um, more, uh, more properly. And it was built, or at least the, the remains uh, that we have today, the, the earliest of those dates, the time of Tutmosis III, hence the reference to Menkepera. Um, it goes on, the prospect of hunger and thirst has driven us to this. There is no clothing, there is no ointment, there is no fish, there are no vegetables. Send to Pharaoh, our good Lord, about it, and send to the vizier, our superior, that we may be supplied with provisions. So the, the crew um, referred to here are the state workmen who are involved in state construction projects in this area, specifically construction of tombs in the Valley of the Kings. So they would expect to be and normally would be paid by the state in the form of whatever provisions we, we can assume, things like clothing, ointment, fish and vegetables, which they refer to here. And essentially, they're not being paid for their work. And so they decided to down tools and stage a sit in in protest. Um, another passage in uh, the same uh, papyrus text reads now Wessahart, Usahart, and Pentarweret have stripped stones from the top of the tomb shaft of the Osiris king Usumatre Setepenre, the great god. Usumatre Setepenre is uh, the coronation name, the pre nomen of Ramesses II. So they apparently stripped the stones away from the top of his tomb in the Valley of the Kings, this is. Uzahart made plans for robbing his tomb and implemented them in the Valley of the Kings. So it's difficult not to associate these two things. We know that the workmen are not being paid. We know that they've staged to sit in and they are apparently now prepared to rob tombs, presumably um, because uh, conditions were such um, that they had no option or were encouraged at least um, to uh, go into tomb robbing in order to make ends meet, perhaps. So there's a strong suggestion that as early as the time of Ramesses III, economic, the economic situation, at least for the state labour force, has become a little bit tricky. And the implications of that for the state are that, you know, that there was a, there was a problem economically. For one reason or another, we don't entirely understand all the causes and effects, but there's something going on here as early as the beginning, pretty much, of the 20th dynasty. Towards the end of the period, um, we see uh, another few interesting phenomena um, occurring. And one of them is represented by this scene, which is um, 
to be found uh, on the walls of the temple of Ammon at Karnak. Superficially, it might look like a fairly familiar type of scene. We have an image of the king, uh, Ramesses IX, in this case, on the right-hand side, wearing the blue crown, raising his arm towards a shaven-headed priest who is identified as the chief priest of Ammon, Amenhotep, a man called Amenhotep. What is um, very interesting and unusual about this scene is that rather than being depicted at a much larger scale than this mortal man, Amenhotep, the king is depicted at the same size as Amenhotep, apply, implying a kind of equivalence between the two of them. Now, either uh, the power, authority, significance of the chief priest of Ammon has somehow become elevated at this point, or the power and authority of, of the king has diminished, or a mixture of the two. In any case, this is unprecedented, um, and it's an important development. It's a further indication of a weakening of the central administration in the person of the king. And events start to move rather quickly from, um, from around this time onwards. Um, we know that no later than the 12th year of Ramesses the 11th, a couple of reigns later, the Viceroy of Nubia, a man called Parnexi, arrived in Thebes to restore order for some reason. So there is disorder for some reason. And the Viceroy of Nubia is the king's deputy in, uh, in the territory to the south of Aswan, Nubia, Kush. Um, the title is Sarnesu en Kush, which literally translated means King's Son of Kush. Um, it, it's usually written as Viceroy, um, which is a funny word deriving from the French Viceroy. Um, I think deputy is, is really the sense of it. So he's, he's the king's man in Kush. Um, Parnexi um, journeys beyond his own territory, uh, north to Thebes to restore order. And in so doing, he became overseer of the granaries uh, of Thebes in order to feed his troops. Now, overseer of the granaries might not sound like a, um, a, a very sort of important high ranking position, but of course the granaries are at the center of the Egyptian economy. Grain is, is almost the, the sort of the, um, the default currency in Egypt. And um, Egypt is of course very, very productive agriculturally and grain is, is a staple of, of everybody's diet. And the Theban granaries would have been among the, the largest anywhere in the country, if not perhaps the largest. This being because the temple at Karnak and probably other institutions in the area as well, controlled not only lands in Thebes itself, but territory up and down the Nile Valley. And the agricultural products from those lands would, would go to Karnak and these other institutions to be stored in the granaries and then redistributed to the priests and other people in the employ of the temple. So temples um, were kind of like micro economies in their own right, redistributive um, economies in their own right. And Karnak is about as big uh, um, an institution of this kind as there was. So actually taking charge of the granaries is really rather significant. It, it puts you in charge of a significant chunk of the Theban economy. This apparently brought Parnexi into conflict with the high priest Amenhotep, who then appeals to the king for help. You might expect um, that the chief priest would be a rival to the king, but apparently not in this instance. It's to the king that he, he asked for assistance in opposing Parnexi. Parnexi, from this point, goes even further and marches further north from the fourth known, fourth administrative district um, here, um, uh, in which Thebes is to be found, all the way to the 17th known of Upper Egypt, uh, all the way up uh, here in, uh, in what is now Middle Egypt, we refer to as Middle Egypt. It's not entirely clear where he was going, what his final destination was going to be, but it's a bit difficult not to think that he was perhaps on his way to pay a visit to Pharaoh, um, who himself was based in the northeastern delta at the city of Peramses, Peramese. In any case, uh, he was engaged at this point, repelled um, by an envoy of the king, a military general, we're not exactly sure of the identity of this general, but it must have been one of 
um, two really important figures to have held this title at this time, either Pai Ank, uh, who we see on the left, or Harry Hoare, who we see on the right here. Um, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of this uh, here, um, but I follow the line that it was Pai Ank at this point, who was the military general who, who, uh, who met um, and repelled Parnexi. In any case, um, this general subsequently took on a number of uh, titles in addition to the military title he already held, commander of the armies uh, or military general. So he became at this point the Viceroy of Nubia, taking over the jurisdiction of, of that um, part of the world. He became Vizier, putting him in charge of the judiciary, of lawmaking and, and, uh, um, and court rulings. And he became Chief Priest as successor to Amenhotep, putting him in charge of the temple. So um, you can imagine by this point, Pai Yang, possibly Harry Hall, is in charge in just about, of, of just about all the major governmental departments. Uh, the military, the economy, um, the temple, uh, and the judiciary, and he's in charge of this chunk of territory to the south in, in Nubia. He's obviously a very, very powerful man, and this uh, seems to have um, been marked by a transition to a new era, um, which involves a new uh, means of dating events. So uh, traditionally, normally, um, Egyptian events are dated to the reign of a king. So if an inscription um, is, uh, uh, is commissioned um, commemorating a particular event, a battle or um, donations to a temple or the issuing of a decree or an oracular pronouncement or whatever it is, they're dated to the reign of a king, year such and such, in the reign of king such and such. From this point onwards, um, events and uh, other happenings would be dated to um, a new era, not invoking the name of the king, but the phrase Wehem Mezut, which literally translated means something like repeating of births, but which we take to mean something like a, the, the birth of a new era. Um, and it was a, a new era, not as would normally be the case, marked by the emergence or the coronation of a new king, but by something else. And this new era, Wehem Mezut, um, as I say, was used to date events. So uh, an event could be year one Wehem Mezut, year five Wehem Mezut, etc., etc. And this date line um, was in use now in parallel um, to the date lines um, evoking the name of the king in the north, Ramesses the eleventh. Um, Ramesses the eleventh, year nineteen. Uh, is the point at which the Wehem Mezut began. So Ramesses the 11th year 19 equals Wehem Mezut um, year one. It's sometimes, by the way, referred to in the literature as the period of Renaissance. Um, I guess because, you know, Renaissance, the French word, um, means kind of re rebirth. Um, we tend, of course, to associate it with the, with the um, rediscovery of, of knowledge and um, and, and artistry uh, in Italy in the 15th century or around that time. For that reason, I don't, I, I don't think it's a very good, um, uh, a very good word for this period. It's not really the same thing, um, but uh, you will see that in the literature. So if you ever see, uh, you know, the idea of a uh, late New Kingdom Renaissance, it's referring to the Wehen Mesu period. Um, so Ramesses XI actually continued, despite all of this, this tumult and the emergence of um, individuals such as the high priest Amenhotep and now this new sort of super general Pai Yang, possibly Harry Hoare at this time, and a, a, and a, uh, a related diminution in the uh, authority of the king. Ramesses XI continues on the throne for a further 10 years. And he had a tomb constructed for him in the Valley of the Kings in continuation of a long sequence of tombs in the Valley, which had begun in the early 18th dynasty. It's one of the, of course, the defining characteristic features of the New Kingdom is the use of this cemetery site um, for the burial of kings. But although he had a tomb prepared for himself, KV number four, it was never used. Um, and we take this to be a sign that by the end of his reign, the end of his life, um, 
the authority of uh, Pharaoh Ramesses XI had diminished to the extent that he no longer had any sway or influence in Thebes at all. His authority was confined um, to his, um, his region, um, the region around the capital city of Ramesses in the Delta. So this confirms this sort of split at this point. He's no longer in charge of, of this important part of the country. The South is not clear to what extent um, there was a kind of southern kingdom or what, what its boundaries might be, but he had lost control. And this, of course, in fact, brings about the end of the use of the Valley of the Kings as a cemetery for the burial of kings. Um, and it's perhaps partly to do with the, the diminution in the authority of the king, but also to the spate of tomb robberies that we began to hear about in the Turing Strike Papyrus um, in the time of Ramesses III, but which we know from various other sources, um, particularly the other papyri in, in, a, in a group which altogether are known as the tomb robbery papyri, for obvious reasons, that, that these robberies continued um, throughout the 20th dynasty. Um, and it seems that the um, threat to, to the security of these tombs, encouraged by the declining economic situation, is what led eventually to the bodies of the kings being removed from uh, the tombs in the valley and uh, reburied um, ultimately in at least two uh, caches, one of them in the valley of the kings in KB35, the tomb originally made for Amenhotep II, the other of them in Theban tomb 320, sometimes um, referred to as DB, Der al-Bahri 320. It's not very far away from the Temple of Hatshepsut and the other monuments at Der al-Bahri, um, most commonly referred to as the Royal Cache. Um, so the, the Royal Line, um, from the historical point of view, what's important here is that the Royal Line has got no um, connection, no sway, no influence in Thebes anymore, and so it can't um, continue to construct tombs uh, in the area and the Valley of the Kings for this reason, and probably the robberies uh, is abandoned. By the way, it continues in use, just not by kings. Um, and there aren't really any new monuments cut. The use uh, from this point on is confined to, to reuse, really. So this ushers in uh, the third intermediate period. We have the transition from the 20th dynasty to the 21st, the new kingdom, uh, in Egyptological terms, to what we call the Third Intermediate Period. Um, in the literature, again, there's not 100% uh, um, consistency in what the Third Intermediate Period is taken to mean, um, but, the, but generally speaking, it's thought to refer to Manetho's dynasties 21 to 25. You'll occasionally see 25 um, lumped in with the uh, the late period, which is the next big chunk of Egyptian history, which takes us up to the uh, time of the second Persian domination, Alexander the Great and the Ptolemaic. Um, but generally speaking, as I said, the 25th dynasty is included with these others as the third intermediate period. Um, it is a complicated and um, confused period about which scholars are still arguing and um, for which every so often um, things have to be changed and the sequence of kings altered, um, uh, kings suddenly appear in, in, uh, in the lists when a new piece of evidence is discovered or sometimes they disappear from the list if it's, if it's shown that actually the, um, a particular name is a, is a phantom. Um, so the, the evidence um, is, is still, even today, being um, reinterpreted by scholars. And as I say, you know, every so often a new discovery brings to light a new piece of evidence which causes us to rip things up and, and, and reorder things. And that's the sort of thing we're going to be dealing with in the, in this, the next talk that I give later this month on the chronology of the um, Third Intermediate Period. So I'm only going to deal in the very sort of big picture um, generalities here. We'll get into the nitty gritty if you're brave enough um, in this um, next lecture later in the in the month. Um, I hope that's going to be fun. Mm. Um, so for now, just to set the the scene, the twenty first dynasty in essence involves a split of, of the country, and it's this this split that we were seeing at the end of the twentieth dynasty between a line of kings based in the north and a group of powerful individuals. Um, beginning probably with, with Pai Yang, 
um, who uh, collected together a number of titles, giving them authority over all these key departments, um, at least in the, the southern part of the country. Um, uh, the title which these southern individuals use um, more prominently than any other is Chief Priest of Ammon, the High Priest of Ammon, um, uh, Hemnetra Tep and Imen. Um, uh, although they held all these other positions as well, they, for the most part, stopped short of declaring themselves king. Um, but they adopted certain of the trappings of kingship. So, for example, um, some of these individuals um, had themselves depicted on temple walls as, as part of their responsibilities. They, they were um, able to and responsible for the construction of new monuments in important places like Karnak. So, for exam example, um, much of the temple of Konsu within the main Ammon enclosure of Karnak, a, a major temple in its own right, was built during the reign of um, Heri Hor and decorated by Heri Hor, um, who we see um, here appearing third in this list of powerful Theban chief priests. Um, and in, in, in those scenes, in the, in the scenes decorating the walls, um, Heri Hor depicts himself um, in direct communion with the gods, which previously had been the prerogative of the king. So this is a, a part of that role, which was now taken on um, by the Theban chief priest. Um, Herihor and others also enclosed their names in a cartouche, um, um, which, you know, again, is, is something which previously had been reserved for Pharaoh and in some cases, other members of the royal family. Um, interestingly, they also enclosed the title of chief priest within that cartouche as well, a little bit as though it was that, that, that title in particular, rather than that of army commander or um, vizier, et cetera, et cetera, which, which bestows upon them these um, important um, powers, if you like. So to all intents and purposes, um, these Theban chief priests have equivalent authority in the Theban region, the, or the whole of um, the southern half of Egypt, um, equivalent authority to Pharaoh. It's just that they stop short of adopting, adopting every aspect of kingship, including calling themselves uh, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, lord of the two lands, the son of Ra, etc. Um, meanwhile, we have a parallel line of rulers in the north um, who do adopt all of the trappings of kingship. And it's this line um, in the north that was known to Manetho. So when Manetho was writing his history, as far as he was concerned, after the 20th dynasty, there was a 21st dynasty um, of kings, uh, including, as we can see from the, the, uh, the column on the left hand side here, kings with names like Smendes, Neferkeres, Susenes, Amenophthys, Osokor, Sinaches and Susenes. Um, Manetho was not aware um, of the Theban chief priests, and not aware, therefore, of this split in the country. He followed this idea that there was one king on the throne um, at all times, pretty much, in Egypt. And as far as he was concerned, the 21st dynasty line was it. It's only archaeological and textual evidence that's given us this much more nuanced picture of a split in the country in these two lines. Um, so um, I'm not going to go into too much detail um, about uh, the, the individuals concerned here. The one other important thing I think to say is that despite the fact that there's this split and despite the fact that you would expect that these two lines were in some sense rivals um, to one another, um, interestingly enough, there are uh, clear connections between the two and alliances. So, for example, um, the first king of the 21st dynasty line, whose name appears as Smendes in Manetho, but um, more like Nezubar Nebjed in uh, the hieroglyphs in the, in the ancient Egyptian, um, married Tent Amun B, who is a daughter of Ramesses IX. So that makes clear the connection between the 20th dynasty and the 21st. But as we'll see from a couple of reigns later, we can see that Susenes I, or Pasevkar Newt in, uh, in the Egyptian, was a son of Penugem I, and Henut Tawi. 
The Henut Tawi is a, is a daughter of Ramesses XI. So again, there's a connection between the preceding 20th dynasty line and the 21st. But Pinujem I is actually um, one of our uh, chief priests to adopt some of the trappings of kingship. So perhaps um, uh, in Suseni's uh, rise to the throne um, as part of the 21st dynasty line, we should see an attempt on the part of uh, the two groups to kind of create some kind of an alliance. So we needn't necessarily see there as, as being great antagonism between the two groups. Perhaps there was there was a, a kind of agreement that this was the best way of doing things. You guys rule in the north and we'll take charge in the south. And in fact, although scholars are still arguing about this, it is um, quite likely, we think now, that Pasib Khan Newt II, Susenis II of the 21st uh, dynasty line was in fact one and the same uh, as Pasib Khan Newt III, um, who appears in the chief priestly line. It's quite uh, probable that this Pasib Khan Newt Susenis, uh, who was chief priest, also went on to become pharaoh, at which point, of course, the two lines are one and the same. So just a bit of um, geography. Um, uh, I've highlighted here some of the, the sites we've uh, already been talking about. Um, the, the southernmost pin in the map uh, here um, lands on um, the modern city of Luxor, which of course is the site of the ancient city of Thebes with the temple of Amun at Karnak a little way to the north, about three kilometers to the north. Um, just a little way south of um, modern Cairo, uh, the pin is in the map here at the site of Memphis capital city for most of Egypt's history, but perhaps um, undergoing a, a period of um, less, uh, lesser significance at this point, Thebes having become the base for the uh, um, chief priests and the capital city of the 21st or 20th and 21st dynasty kings, having moved northwards to the Delta, the Northeastern Delta to this region here. Um, incidentally, the sites uh, in, in this um, region here, um, around about where we see Benny Swaif labelled on the map, these are the sites of uh, El Heba, um, which was known as um, Tuzoi um, or um, um, Tayujait uh, in the Egyptian, and Heracleopolis Magna. Um, Neni Nezut. Um, these uh, are both candidates for the, the kind of the, for frontier towns um, in between the two territories. We're not exactly sure where the boundary was, but it seems likely that it was in this sort of region. So Pharaoh controls the northernmost stretch of the Nile Valley and the Delta region, the chief priests, everything to the south of, of this. Um, just um, just a, a little um, piece about the shifting of the capital city. Um, this region is, is, is very significant for the Second Intermediate Period, Early New Kingdom, Later New Kingdom and 21st Dynasty. And the three sites that I've, I've marked here, uh, which are relevant, are the, the, the sites marked by a red pin, which is slightly obscured by an orange pin, and then the green one here. The yellow pin, by the way, is at another important third intermediate period site, Telbasta, Bu Bastis, um, the cult center of the cat goddess um, Bastet. We will visit um, Telbasta um, towards the end of this talk. Um, but these are the important ones here in, in the Northeast. The um, uh, red pin is at the site of Avaris, Avaris um, which was the capital of the Hyksos kings of the second intermediate period. Um, it's uh, on the site of the modern uh, village of Teledaba. Uh, it probably became the capital of the Hyksos in part because um, they came from the region of the Levant and settled um, a little way over the border into Egypt in this area. So, so, so this perhaps explains in part why their capital was here, but it's also significant that it was on the Pelusiac branch of the Nile. Um, there were a number of branches of the Nile in the Delta region in ancient times, and this was one of the major branches connected with the site of Pelusium, 
um, which is sort of at the boundary of the edge of the Delta and Sinai, and so therefore a major entry point into Egypt proper from uh, the Levant region up here. Um, so we can imagine um, Hyksos and anybody else entering the country from this direction, um, arriving at Pelusium and then beginning to sail um, up this branch in the direction of Memphis and the Nile Valley and, and finding that this particular place um, on that, that branch um, was um, an excellent spot in terms of communication with, uh, with Pelusium in one direction and Memphis in the other. So the Hyksos built their capital here. Even after the defeat of the Hyksos, under the late 17th dynasty king Camose and um, his successor Ahmose the first, the founder of the 18th dynasty, founder of the New Kingdom, um, that city continued to be important. It was an important um, uh, center for early 18th dynasty kings, and certainly down until the time of Thutmose the first. And we can imagine that it remained occupied after that, even if it lost some of its significance. And this general area becomes very, very important again in the reign of Ramesses II at the beginning of um, the 19th dynasty, um, when he founded a brand new capital city, um, a mere two kilometres away from um, Avaris, a brand new city named after him per Ramesses, the House of Ramesses, um, which is on the site of modern Kantia. And that's where the orange pin is here. So per Ramesses is more or less exactly on the same spot, just two kilometres away from where Avaris had been. So this, this point on the Pelusiac branch of the Nile was of strategic importance and, and, and importance in other ways to both the Hyksos and the early Ramesides. And it remains the capital um, down until the end of the 20th dynasty, the end of the New Kingdom. So we assume that this is where Ramesses XI was um, at the time that he was losing his grip on the rest of the country. And we assume probably that he was buried in the vicinity um, of, uh, of this city as well, although his tomb has never been found. Um, subsequently, in the 21st dynasty, the capital city moved, we now know, to Tanis, which is where the green pin is, about 30 kilometres to the north and a little way to the east of Paramesis. Um, we believe now that the reason for uh, this move, the shift in capital city from Paramesi to Tanis, is that the um, the Pelusiac branch of the Nile had begun to silt up, or in particular, at, at the point where Paramesi was, was constructed, to the extent that the city was no longer viable, or it were, at least wasn't in such a great spot. Um, so they looked for an alternative location, and in fact, Tanis um, was uh, on um, another river branch, the Tanitic branch, named after Tanis, um, which presumably made it um, more viable. Um, it essentially had all the qualities that Avaris and Paramesis had in earlier times um, with effective uh, links between um, the Mediterranean in one direction and the Nile Valley in the other. And so the capital city moved. And Tanis is where we're going to be for Monte's uh, discoveries. Um, just by the way, it's occasionally claimed, or it has been claimed in the last um, few years in uh, the news media that um, Tanis um, was discovered uh, in only in the last few years as a result of satellite remote sensing. Um, I think this is entirely a, a misunderstanding on the part of, uh, of the news media. Um, in fact, um, Tanis was known to Napoleon's savants um, who recorded this um, really rather good for its time um, plan of the site. So what we're looking at here is the outline of the tell. The tell is an Arabic word um, which describes a, a kind of um, mound, a mound which we typically see in Egypt but in, in, uh, in other places around um, the Near and Middle East. Um, and uh, these tells, certainly in the case of the Egyptian Delta, are not natural mounds, but they are formed of um, mud brick, layers and layers and layers of, of mud brick and, and accumulated debris that are essentially the result of centuries and centuries of building houses and other buildings in mud brick. Those houses either being f falling down or being demolished and then rebuilt. And every time there is a rebuilding, because of demolition and accumulation, the, the buildings are built at a slightly higher level. So every time you go through this process of a deconstruction and, uh, and reconstruction, the level of the ground rises. And eventually, after centuries and centuries, that, that gives rise to a mound. 
And these mounds are, are very distinctive. They're very visible on the ground, as it were, although some, some of them are, are so sort of low lying that they're almost imperceptible. But the color of the ground actually has a kind of, it has a dark brown quality to it. It looks like mud, um, but it's not natural mud. It's, this is actually mud brick. Um, uh, if not mud bricks themselves, then the, the detritus from decaying mud bricks. So they're very, very distinctive and not perhaps very beautiful. And when you visit somewhere like Tanis, you're looking at a vast, muddy landscape. Um, but you have to think of this in archaeological terms as a, as a vast, ancient city. Um, and uh, what the Napoleonic um, expedition had done here is to map the outline of the tell, the point at which it begins to rise up from the flatter um, agricultural landscape around it, and to map the, the mounds, which you can see in the centre here. And um, as is absolutely typical for um, ancient cities like this, in the centre, there is a, a linear structure, not quite rectangular. It's, it's sort of, uh, there's a sort of slight kind of trapezoid shape to it here. And this is the temple enclosure, the enclosure of the Temple of Ammon. And again, this is where, exactly where we are going to be um, for uh, Monte's excavations uh, today. Um, the templar areas, incidentally, are quite often at a lower level from the rest of the mound. This being because more care was taken to, to clear the temple at regular intervals. Um, and because being built of stone, generally speaking, temples don't get demolished and rebuilt, demolished, rebuilt in the same way. They, they stay where they are and the area around them is cleared. So while the mud brick and other buildings are creating the sort of tell around them, um, there's typically a dip in the centre. And this is a... Um, um, something that archaeologists will look for when they're looking for tell sites is, you know, where's that sort of dip, lower lying land in the centre? That'll be where the temple is or was. And um, they're great also for spotting on uh, um, satellite uh, images um, as well, because uh, in the landscape, um, tells show up as, as brown spots with green agricultural land all around them. Um, so it's good fun, um, despite the fact that, as I say, um, Tanis was not found by satellite remote sensing. It's, it's good fun spotting ancient sites in satellite images. It's very easy to do. And um, the Napoleonic expedition was followed. I'm very sorry, this caption is wrong. I should have corrected this, um, but uh, I'm sorry, this caption is wrong. This is a plan made by Jean-Jacques Rifo in um, the 1820s. He visited the site in 1825. Um, Rifo you may remember if you've heard me speak about this kind of thing before, it is a, a kind of French equivalent of um, Giovanni Battista Belzoni. So Belzoni was a, a great um, digger and remover of large uh, objects from Egyptian sites in the 1820s, and his French counterpart was Jean-Jacques Rifo. So a lot of the very biggest sculptures and other things in museums like the Louvre in Paris and um, Museo Egizio in Turin are, are, are come from the excavations of Rifo. And he was at Tanis in 1825, um, digging things up um, and creating this plan which is um, uh, not not um, uh, absolutely um, accurate um, as uh, judged from today's standards but nonetheless it, it shows you again the uh, the mounds the extent of the uh, of the tell to some extent and the nearby modern village of um, San El Haga uh, which is the modern name for the area and then the temple enclosure again with this sort of um, slightly off rectangular um, enclosure wall to it. Um, Rifo also left behind these rather charming um, views of the site. So this is San El Haga um, and, uh, and the local branch of the Nile with the, with the mound beyond and some, uh, some, some built remains of, of the temple visible in the distance. You see them a bit better here in this, um, in this view. Um, Marriott just did the site in the early 1860s and did a bit more digging. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have any images from that. Um, the caption is correct this time. This is um, a photograph taken by Flinders Petrie in February 1884. We can date it quite closely because um, it was clearly taken shortly after a, a very great storm, which he describes uh, in, his, uh, in his journals, which flooded the site. Um, creating great um, pools in and around the um, archaeological remains. Um, this is one of my favourite statues, um, a favourite photo of a favourite statue um, of mine. It's a, a statue that um, I've seen in exactly the same position um, at Tanis. I'm a little bit sad to say that um, in the last few years it's been um, moved 
Um, I think in order to help protect it. So fair enough, but I'm, I'm I'm a little bit sad that it's not going to be in place where it had been for centuries and centuries. Um, but we're going to be able to get a better look at it now because it's been re-erected in the um, entrance way to the new Grand Egyptian Museum. Um, uh, Dr. Mustafa Waziri posted this photograph um, of the uh, of the statue in place now, so you can see it in in all its uh, you know all its glory there. I think it's rather important to. Um, uh, to try and trace the movement of, of these things because it um, it easily gets lost. Um, so it was until recently at Tanis and uh, now it's in Giza. Um, and that statue is, is a statue of Ramesses II at Tanis. And you might already be thinking, but hang on, Chris told us that um, Ramesses capital was 30 kilometers to the south at Per Ramesses and the transfer to Tanis and the inauguration of Tanis as a capital city didn't happen until the 21st dynasty. Um, well, um, in fact, most of, uh, I think it's fair to say, the stone remains um, within the temple area at Tanis um, bear inscriptions of Ramesses II. The reason being that uh, when the uh, capital transferred, the new capital city was built, rather than quarrying entirely new stone and building entirely new temples, um, the ancients very sensibly, I think, decided that the better thing to do was to simply dismantle the Ramesside temple at Paramesis and move it um, some 30 kilometers away. A big, uh, a big effort, of course, um, lots of work in that, but, but quite possibly not as much work in quarrying new stone and building new temples from scratch. So for that reason, despite the fact that this is a 21st dynasty onwards temple in terms of when it was erected, um, the stone and the inscriptions are all of the time, or largely all of the time, of Ramesses II. This, incidentally, fooled archaeologists for a long time into thinking that Tanis was Pyramesi. And it was only in the 1960s and 70s that the work at Kantir and Avaris and Tanis all together showed the relationship between them and revealed that this must have been what the ancients did. They must have moved these things. Um, rather than this being the spot of uh, Ramesses capital city. By the way, along with the removal of that term statue, these uh, obelisks um, and columns which you see re-erected here have only just been put back up in the last um, couple of years. So on the one hand, they do a good job um, of showing where the main axis of the temple was and where some of these things would have stood and they give you maybe more of a sense of the three-dimensionality of the temple and the architectural shape of it. Um, I, I think something is slightly lost in terms of the sort of um, romantic vision of a ruin field. Um, I mean, that's entirely a, a personal opinion. But, um, but again, just to say, uh, in case you were thinking that these obelisks have been standing since the time of Susenis and co, um, not so. They've only been um, up since about 2018, 19, I think. Anyway, finally, we have arrived at the point of um, Pierre Monte's excavations. Um, so um, Monte uh, inaugurated um, what turned out to be a very long lasting French archeological project um, at the site. He worked there himself from 1929 to 1956. There was then a, a, a break and the French excavations were resumed under the directorship of Jean Yoyot, um, subsequently Philippe Brissot, and since 2013, Francois Leclerc. Um, and so that uh, French mission begun by Pierre Monte in 1929 is essentially still at the site um, even today. So it's a very, very long running archaeological project. And the fact that they are still there, still working, still excavating is a testimony to the the extent of this vast uh, ancient city. But the discovery we are going to be talking about today was made um, relatively early on in uh, the time of the French um, mission in 1939. So here we are, northeastern delta at Tanis, and specifically we are in the temple area. So this is a modern satellite image, obviously, of uh, the temple. This is that slightly um, trapezoid um, uh, enclosure wall um, with the temple itself in the center and the pin dropped at the point of uh, the excavations we're going to be talking about in the sort of in the southwest corner. Um, you can see by the way, although you don't see much of the agricultural land around the, the edges here, you can see what a muddy blob um, a tail site um, appears as 
in a satellite image just from this this one shape and you can also perhaps see these these undulations here which match quite nicely the plan made more than two centuries ago by napoleon's um savants and also even rifo's uh, plan zooming in a bit um we can see the shape of the temple perhaps a bit better here approximately sort of rectangular here with the the main entrance pylon a little wider than uh, than the rest of the temple and then this um enclosure wall here which doesn't have quite the same alignment don't quite understand that um we can see it perhaps a little bit better in this um in this plan um so again this is the enclosure wall here that's what we see highlighted in in black here um not quite on the same alignment as uh, as the temple itself there is a a, a a secondary larger enclosure wall which is slightly more closely aligned with the um with the temple um the darker one is the 21st dynasty enclosure wall the the larger one is a 30th dynasty um, enlargement um, and that is um, that is what you can really see from from the air it's this overall it's this rectangular shape just sh shifting the alignment so we can see a little bit better some of these labels perhaps the area labeled as necropolis here in the southwest corner um, is where monte made his great discoveries and it's significant um, that these were made within the temple enclosure as we shall see there are not very many photographs um, of the excavations in progress, but this is this is one. Um, so the level of uh, of the of the ground, I think I'm right in saying, at, at the time of um, Monte's excavations, is somewhere up here. So he's already had to excavate some way down to reach the top of the building that we are going to be investigating um, today. So at the point this photograph was taken, he had discovered the necropolis um, but hadn't fully explored it so this is the general um, state of things um, at the beginning of the excavations in march 1939 the previous month um, is when this necropolis was first revealed um, monte was in the southwest corner of the temple enclosure as we've seen and he found there what he originally thought was a handsome to use his word in translation a handsome pavement um, and in that area, a gold cloisonné buckle and shabtis, shabti figurines, which typically would accompany a burial, and these bore the name Shoshenk. Shoshenk is a royal name um, which crops up during the 22nd and 23rd dynasties. So this was very intriguing for two reasons. Firstly, Monte would not have been expecting to find any burials within a temple enclosure. That is not where we would normally expect to find tombs. They would be far distant, um, or at least outside um, the temple area and the, and the city area. Um, we would not um, uh, expect really to find them right slap bang in the middle of the settlement within the temple enclosure itself. Um, we are told that Monte um, sort of used a stick to, to knock on the pavement and could hear from this that it was hollow. And so he lifted what he believed to be the pavement, only to find that it was not a pavement, but rather a ceiling slab um, from the roof of, um, of a building. From here, he descended down into this building and was confronted with a sequence of chambers decorated with quite fine um, images and inscriptions bearing the cartouches of a pharaoh, a Zorkon. And a Zorkon is another um, of these names, um, along with Shoshenk um, and one or two others, which are not Egyptian, they are Libyan names and they are characteristic um, and repeat over and over again um, among the names of the pharaohs of the 22nd and 23rd dynasties. So it will have been very clear to Monte at this point that he had discovered a royal tomb the tomb of an Azorcon, one of the Azorcons, um, and quite possibly the remains of a burial of one of the Shoshinks as well. He wrote, I had the earth and stones blocking the entrance removed and went down into a square chamber with walls covered with figures and hieroglyphics. This led into another chamber with a large sarcophagus emerging from the earth, which filled three quarters of two rooms. Everyone is overjoyed. I had Hassanane's team come with all the carts so that we could clear this remarkable structure as quickly as possible. And this is what he had found. He had come down into uh, this room here, 
a kind of antechamber, in fact, um, from which several further chambers um, led, uh, led off. So the first one, the first of the, the main chambers that were labelled one in this sequence is this chamber here, which was found uh, almost completely filled with an enormous um, sarcophagus, but it was found to be empty um, and uninscribed, anonymous. There was no clue as to who uh, was buried there. And in fact, to this very day, we still do not know um, whose burial this was, or if it was even um, uh, a burial of anybody in the event. Um, chamber number two was found to be empty. Um, three, however, contained um, a monumental sarcophagus, in fact, of the Middle Kingdom, so a sarcophagus which was originally cut around about a thousand years um, prior to the time of the 22nd dynasty. The chamber decorated again with inscriptions of an Azorcon, but the burial itself proved um, to be that of um, another pharaoh of the 22nd dynasty, um, uh, Takaloth I. Um, Tataloth is another of these Libyan names characteristic of the 22nd and 23rd dynasties. So um, we've got another pharaoh apparently involved now. And from here, Monte proceeded to chamber number four uh, on the map here, uh, which proved to be the burial of An Azorkon, Azorkon the second to be precise. So it seems as though this was the main burial in this um, structure. Um, the burial of the individual whose name and image was all over the walls. And the uh, chamber was also found to have been extended at a certain point um, to uh, accommodate the burial of a son of Zorkon II, a man called Hornacht, Prince Hornacht. You may just about be able to make out in the ceiling on this photograph um, a deep inscription. It is in fact um, a cartouche of um, Ramesses Meri Amun, the son of Ra. Um, uh, this is again an inscription of the time of Ramesses II, showing that this um, building was in fact constructed in part of recycled masonry from a monument of Ramesses II. So uh, rather than cutting brand new tombs of brand new stones, the 21st and 22nd dynasty kings, it seems, were not afraid of recycling stone at least. And as we can see from the recycling of the sarcophagus of the Middle Kingdom for the burial of Tatlov the first, not afraid of recycling uh, stone um, from um, prior funerary uses as well. The burial of the Zorkon II was found to have been ransacked, but a number of items were found in that chamber, um, including this um, canopic chest, which we see in the, in the image here, which would have housed canopic jars with the mummified internal organs of the king. Um, three skeletons were found inside the sarcophagus itself, one of them we assume uh, being uh, the, the body of Azorkon II. It's a bit of a mystery um, who the other two uh, were. There was the remains of a, a gilded coffin, the gilding being non-organic uh, survived. Um, the wood of the coffin, however, did not. The environmental conditions in these tombs are not good for the preservation um, of organic materials such as wood. Um, he also found the gold frames of two falcon eyes, which subsequently it would become clear were probably part of a falcon-headed coffin or cartonnage, something like that. And we'll see more of these falcon heads as we go along. And various items and fragments of jewellery. The sarcophagus box of um, Prince Hornacht turned out to have been recycled from another masonry block of Ramesses II. It actually came from an architrave, part of a building um, of Ramesses II. As you can see, um, it was broken into here by robbers, um, further demonstrating that these tombs um, sadly had been ransacked. Um, the lid of this coffin survived um, rather well and is now on display in the Open Air Museum um, at Tanis. It's an anthropoid um, coffin lid um, of quartzite with a, a rather sort of um, fleshy and stylized, um, but I think rather charming face. So this is the Prince Hornacht. Um, who was buried with this rather splendid set of um, canopic jars, which were recovered more or less intact from the same burial chamber. So this is um, the the or these are the buildings which um, which Monte had um, discovered. He he found that um, what the ancients had done was to cut into the ground and then to build 
these buildings of, of mostly recycled masonry. You might be able to make out uh, an image of a, I think it's a god here on this granite slab, which has been used as part of the um, part of the roof here. So rather unceremonially recycled decorated blocks from um, pre-existing monuments. And there are in fact um, several buildings visible here. I'll untangle that um, as we go along. So a cutting had been built and then these um, buildings built inside the cutting and then the area around them filled with debris so that they could effectively be buried. Um, so Monte, um, although what Monte had originally thought was a pavement was in fact uh, the roof of, uh, of this monument, um, he, he found it beneath the level of the Ptolemaic floor. So by the time of the Ptolemies, these, these tombs were thoroughly buried and invisible. Um, they are all given um, numbers um, preceded by these three letters NRT. Um, uh, these stand for Necropole Royale de Tanis um, in, the, uh, in the French, so essentially the royal tombs of Tanis. And the first of these tombs is number one. And the next one, which Monte discovered, is in fact number three um, in the numbering sequence. Essentially, Monte came down around about, well, around about here um, and uh, entered the monument on this side. But he then, uh, as his next move, began to extend his excavations northwards in this direction, revealing what is in fact a second building. And this building is entered from um, uh, a shaft at the eastern end over here, um, which is still the way into the tomb to this day for anybody lucky enough to get permission to go inside. Um, once inside, um, Monte again um, was confronted with a series of chambers um, decorated with um, reliefs on the walls, this time bearing the name overwhelmingly of a pharaoh named Parsev Kai Newt, um, a name we know better by the Greek form Susenes. And that's the name in the uh, in the cartouche uh, here, Par Sebar Ka in Newt, um, beloved of Ammon, um, beloved um, of the god Ammon. So this appeared to be the tomb of Susenes, a name which crops up twice in the 21st dynasty list. So this appeared to be an earlier tomb, a 21st dynasty royal tomb. Monte was really on a roll uh, by this point, um, naturally. So he came in here. Um, via the roof here and um, removed a blocking entering into a short passageway and then a kind of antechamber and although this appears not to have been a, a burial chamber proper he was nonetheless confronted with the astonishing sight of a, a low plinth on which he found a coffin in the center and then two badly composed um, decomposed mummies one either side um, I'm not aware of there being a photograph of the situation, but this drawing was made um, by Fujirus, a member of the team, and it shows the situation uh, that Monte um, discovered. So um, entering from the, the shaft, which is kind of behind the viewer, if you like, we've got a number of, um, of jars, vessels of various kinds, um, images of a king on the, on the rear wall. Then we have this plinth with a falcon headed coffin in the middle and the mummies lying either side. And then in the middle, a sort of mass of debris labeled here, entassement du Shabti, an entanglement of Shabti figurines. Uh, so it's uh, absolutely full of, um, of material, apparently undisturbed. Um, the coffin, um, the falcon headed coffin um, is the coffin that we saw in the opening slide of this talk. It's the solid silver um, coffin of a pharaoh Shoshenk, Hekar Kepere Shoshenk, who according to the current um, consensus among scholars of the period should be um, labelled not just the second, you'll see in early literature who he's referred to as um, Shoshenk the second, we now refer to him as Shoshenk 2A, Hekar Kepere Shoshenk 2A, and he was buried in this extraordinary and exquisite solid silver coffin with very distinctively a falcon head. Um, also with these four solid silver and canopic coffinets, um, which are um, in the current display, placed around the edge of the uh, of the um, of the coffin here. Human-headed coffinets. These would have held the mummified uh, internal organs um, of the king. This is that um, falcon head, as you can see, with the eyes and the beak um, uh, and a kind of and a kind of wig. Um, absolutely exquisitely chased into this um, solid silver. So it's an astonishing um, object. 
um, made of a very considerable quantity of, a, of precious metal, silver, um, and very, very beautifully worked as well. So it's absolutely clear that at the time of Sheshonk II, there was wealth and there was also access to um, extremely skilled um, metal workers. Inside this coffin, um, which was opened incidentally by Monte in the presence of King Farouk of Egypt, um, a mass of material was discovered. Um, the unfortunately badly decomposed mummy of the king himself, um, but a mass of uh, jewellery of various kinds, including um, this uh, winged uh, vulture necklace, echoing the kind that we see in the 18th dynasty. Tutankhamun had several. There was one on the KV-55 mummy. Um, there's a pectoral here um, with, a, uh, with a scarab at the centre, and then this absolutely exquisite um, solid gold bracelet with inlays of uh, lapis and carnelian and gold with a protective um, wedge art eye, uj art eye on the front here. Um, this um, uh, bracelet uh, is on the front of the Oxford History of Ancient Egypt, which I think is a testimony to just, uh, just where it ranks in the, the list of fine objects discovered in, um, in ancient Egyptian tombs and other sites. It's a really, really fabulous uh, piece. Um, and, and also within the same um, coffin, a falcon-headed cartonnage. Um, again, we see this falcon head image in a funerary context for a 22nd dynasty burial. This was very badly decomposed. It was mostly only the gilded parts that had survived, not so much the cartonnage, but it's been very well restored. So you can see it now on display in the Egyptian Museum. And then within that, a solid gold death mask, which we see on the right hand side here. And this might have been part of um, a wooden coffin. It's not entirely clear. There are these little attachments at the top, which seem to have attached it to something, but whatever it was uh, had, uh, had decomposed. In any case, though, the mask itself is very fine. Um, I'm sure you will agree. Um, this uh, occupied um, uh, Monte for the rest of the 1939 season. Um, bear in mind, he's already been comprehensively through NRT1, and there was an awful lot of material in uh, this opening chamber in NRT3 as well. So he'd done an awful lot of work in this one 1939 season. Um, but he cannot have um, avoided noticing that there were two concealed, not very well concealed, entrances in the western wall of the tomb directly ahead of him um, when he entered the tomb, um, one of them presumably containing um, the, the burial of the king whose name appears all over the walls, um, Susenes. Um, in uh, the following season, despite the outbreak of World War II, Monte was able to return at the beginning of 1940, rather than at start by continuing um, his exploration of NRT3, he decided to try and um, trace the full extent of NRT1 and NRT3, followed the west, west Wall, and in fact discovered yet another building, a freestanding tomb, and um, we now call it NRT4. And this contained the decorated sarcophagus of Suseni's successor, Amenemope, um, Amen, um, um, Amen in, uh, in festival, Amen in opet, um, which, uh, whose name you see here, but it was found to be empty. So apart from the sarcophagus, not much to find. This is NRT4 here. So Monte was essentially tracing the outside of the monument and that's when he made this uh, discovery. The um, concealed doorways were, as I say, directly ahead of Monte, um, one here and one in this sort of area here. Um, and we see them better on this plan here. So he, the drawing is, is taken looking in this direction. The entassement du Chapti is sort of here. This is the falcon headed coffin and vessels all around here and concealed doorways beyond the sarcophagus plinth and here to the left. So Cheshonk 2A is here in room five. Um, and the next thing he did was to enter um, the right hand of these two chambers via the concealed doorway and he was confronted with what frankly he had been expecting which was um, the burial of Susenes the first. The first thing he would have seen is the very very large um, sarcophagus um, in fact originally made for the 19th dynasty king successor of Ramses the great Meneptah um, but reinscribed um, for Susenes brought to Tanis from the Valley of the Kings um, you can imagine that the kings of the New Kingdom, having been reburied in these two caches, KV35 and TT320, 
um, but with little other than the coffins and little bits and pieces of funerary equipment, um, much was left behind in the tombs and certainly large things like sarcophagi would have remained and would therefore to some extent have been available. Um, so it obviously made sense uh, to the Tanite kings to make use of these uh, of these spare sarcophagi lying around. It's an interesting, interesting to think that clearly there was this contact between the North and South um, territories at, at, at this point. Inside the uh, sarcophagus of Minetar, there was a second granite sarcophagus, this time in human form, anthropoid, and very finely decorated. And within that, um, another solid silver coffin, this time human form, giving us the face in silver of Susenes um, himself. Um, so this perhaps more than um, any other of the great um, silver objects discovered in these tombs is the one that, that kind of gives us the name silver pharaoh, if you like. Susenes I is, is the silver pharaoh par excellence. So here is that coffin um, lying inside the, um, the uh, granite sarcophagus, um, uh, the anthropoid sarcophagus, and then the box sarcophagus of Menectar as well. And the body of Susenes was um, preserved in, intact. It was unfortunately badly decomposed, but again, the organic, inorganic material had survived quite well, and there was a multiplicity of material inside it, including um, a gold board and a solid gold death mask. Um, so uh, this is the board on the left-hand side with a, a ram-headed uh, vulture um, across the torso just beneath two um, hands um, at the end of crossed arms holding the crook and flail um, and then this um, solid gold death mask um, despite the fact that you know the silver is what makes um, is perhaps the most characteristic feature of these burials and um, there was an awful lot of gold in use as well and, and perhaps the finest object recovered from these tombs is this particular death mask which is maybe not quite a rival in terms of how fine the image is um, for, for the, the death mask of Tutankhamun, but it's, I, I think you'll agree, it's pretty close. Um, and had we not discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun by this point, um, or you know, at all, perhaps this would be um, the, the, the best known or the defining image uh, of, of ancient Egypt. And yet, you know, it, it suffers, I think, by comparison with Tutankhamun. And of course, um, because of the Second World War, um, this discovery didn't get anywhere near as much press coverage um, as uh, the Tutankhamun discovery did uh, as well. It's interesting to, to think of the two as being so closely related. And of course, all of this abundance of precious um, materials, very, very finely crafted, speaks not to a period of decline, but of, um, of considerable wealth um, still, um, at least for the elite, at least for the, um, for the kings. Uh, so as it says here, sorry, boring slide, but Monte was now in a race um, against time. He was able to excavate um, after the beginning of the Second World War, but um, as time wore on, things were going to become more and more difficult for him. Um, Farouk, King Farouk of Egypt, persuaded him to open the second of these two concealed chambers. Um, the decoration around that, uh, the blocking of the doorway, um, had included images of Suseni's successor, Amenemope, and naturally um, it's Amenemope's burial that was found um, inside. And um, this, as in the case of the burial of Suseni's, um, was found to be intact, um, incredibly. So where the tomb of Tutankhamun um, wasn't quite found intact in as much as it was robbed um, on at least two occasions very shortly after the king's death. The robbers only got away with a, with a few things there and so to all intents and purposes the tomb of Tutankhamun was, um, was, was more or less intact but not entirely. These two um, tombs were found completely unviolated. Um, so these are really, truly intact um, royal tombs. Um, so all of these vessels, um, which you can see here, canopic jars, stone vessels, some of them um, heirlooms coming from tombs in the Valley of the Kings, um, were a, a part of the burial of um, Amenemope, um, as it was when it was sealed, um, presumably um, at the end of his lifetime, um, towards the end of the 21st dynasty. You might remember um, that a tomb of Amenemope, or at least a sarcophagus of Amenemope, had been found just outside in NRT4 in this separate building, but it was found empty. So for some reason, it seems that a tomb, a separate tomb, was constructed originally for Amenemope, and then it was decided to move him inside 
um, into the tomb built for Susenes I. And in fact, that meant bumping Susenes' uh, wife um, out of the way. This was originally intended to be a, a sarcophagus and chamber for her. We don't know what happened to her burial. Amenemope was also found with a uh, splendid um, death mask, this being it. It's not quite the rival um, or the equal of the mask of Susenes I, but nonetheless, it's quite fine and it uh, is made from a considerable quantity of solid gold. Again, Amenemope was not a poor man. Um, and continuing his exploration uh, of this um, uh, chamber, he moved to the chamber labelled number three. Um, which was found um, not to, in the, in the event, to have accommodated a burial, but it was being prepared for a son of Susenes, a man called Ankafen Moot. Um, his inscriptions um, had been, it seems, um, tampered with, which some people have interpreted to mean that he fell from grace. So the tomb was being prepared for him, from, but then for some reason he fell out of favour and was never buried there in the event. Um, I, uh, I've only visited this tomb once uh, in um, 2019, and I was somewhat flustered um, by the experience, a little bit panicked, not the calm and rational um, specialist that I've, I'm, I might like to think I am. Uh, and I was being somewhat harassed by a local inspector as well. So I didn't take very good photographs um, in here. So I'm very much indebted to Carl, who I think is here. Hello, Carl, if you are, um, for this photograph of me. Um, trying to stay calm and not panic and take a photograph of the uh, uh, of the sarcophagus of Ankafen Moot. Um, this is uh, the um, oh, pardon me. This is the photograph um, that I took, showing uh, the sarcophagus ultimately unused, almost completely filling uh, the walls of this uh, of this chamber. Um, there was one final chamber, as you can see from the plan, which we haven't dealt with yet, and that's number four uh, here. Um, there is no access uh, to this chamber um, from, um, from, from the antechamber or from anywhere else inside the tomb. The only access is through the roof. Um, it was completely walled in. And in fact, the excavators only realised um, that it was there when um, their surveyor was planning the outline of the tomb and realised that there was a, a space here unaccounted for. So they lifted the roofing slabs and came down on a, another splendid burial, this time not of a royal uh, family member, but a, a high-ranking general, clearly very highly favoured, a man called Wen Jebao Wen Jed, great name. Um, he was buried um, with a number of exquisite objects, including this very fine um, death mask, again recalling the, the Shoshank death mask, rather more than the Susenis and Menomope masks. And um, among other things, this absolutely fantastic patera made of both gold and silver with a very finely um, chaste inscription mentioning the name of um, Susenes here and um, indeed uh, Wen Jebahu and Jed here who's um, uh, commander-in-chief of the armies he's given his proper title here in the center in gold is this really lovely scene of female swimmers swimming amongst fish and birds and plants it's a uh, um, uh, as far as I know, pretty much a unique scene, I think, and, and uh, fabulous. Clearly, when Jebai and Jed was um, very highly uh, rated. Um, beyond this point, Monte exposed um, one or two further buildings, including NRT5, which is at the top right um, here. Um, and this was found, as you can see from the photograph, to involve fairly straightforwardly two um, chambers um, in, and containing two sarcophagi, um, one of them for Uzumatre Setepenre Shoshenk III and another for Hedgekepere Setepenre Shoshenk IV, two further kings of the 22nd dynasty. And this is what that uh, tomb looks like today. There's a little iron um, staircase that you can walk up um, and then look down into the tomb um, from the, uh, the tomb walls. Um, it turned out that actually there was some evidence of further kings having been buried in um, uh, NRT3 as well. You might remember that either side of the falcon-headed silver sarcophagus of Shoshank 2A, there were these two very badly decayed mummies and this entanglement of shabtis. Um, the shabtis are not very nice, um, as you can see from these two examples on the right-hand side, but... Um, some of them bore the names of pharaohs Siamon, 
and Susenes II, the last two kings of the 21st dynasty line. So the assumption is that those two decomposed bodies either side of Shosheng 2a are indeed these two kings buried um, without too much ceremony, it seems, but nonetheless, here they are. Um, and finally, there's a sort of extension of um, NRT1. Um, NRT1 is, is this uh, part of the tomb. NRT2, um, which is a bit of a mystery. We don't exactly know when it was added to NRT1, and we don't really know very much about its function or purpose. Um, but among um, uh, various items found in the tomb were fragments of canopic jars with the name of an Uzum Martre Setep Enre. If this is the burial of another king, Uzumatre Setepenre is a name which crops up over and over again in this period. It was the coronation name of Ramses II. He was the first to have that name, but it was then used again and again in the Third Intermediate Period. But all the other kings we know of with that pre are accounted for elsewhere uh, in the necropolis. The only king with that name whose burial we don't otherwise know about is Pharaoh Parmi um, of the later 22nd dynasty. So on this basis, we assume perhaps um, NRT2 was constructed for him. So in summary, these are the two dynasties, 21st and 22nd, with the, the, um, the kings who for whom there is some evidence of them having buried, been buried in uh, Tanis, highlighted in uh, light grey. So as you can see, we don't have the burials of the first two kings of the 21st dynasty. Um, Nezubar Nebjed, or better known as Smendes, or Am Amenemnisu, um, Amun, who is as the king. Um, but Susenes I, um, very famously, um, is represented. Amenemope buried in the chamber next to him. Azorkon the Elder is missing, as it were. Siamun and Susenes II are the two badly decomposed mummies, um, either side of Shoshenk 2a in NRT3. Then we're missing the first two kings of the 22nd dynasty, Sheshonk the first and Azorkon um, the first. We have Shoshenk 2a inside the solid silver coffin. Shoshenks 2b and 2c are um, almost unknown in the evidence. We have just the tiniest little scraps of evidence for their existence here and there. Um, we don't know what their relationships were to one another or to the kings that came before them or after them. We don't even know. Um, exactly what their place is in the sequence, but the Egyptological consensus is that they should be placed in between Azorkon the first and Takloth um, the first. In any case, one of them certainly buried at Tunis, the other two, who knows. We then have a, a, a nice unbroken sequence, apparently, of kings buried here. Takloth the first and um, buried by his son and successor Azorkon the second in NRT1, the first two Monte entered. Sheshonk the third and fourth buried in NRT5, a separate building just a little way away. Parmi, perhaps in the extension to NRT1, NRT2, and that just leaves Sheshonk the fifth, the last king of the line, um, whose whereabouts is unknown. Um, one interesting addition to all of this, although we don't have clear evidence of his burial, um, this item with the name of Nefakare Amenemnisu was discovered um, at Tanis, and this is the first clear evidence we have that a king of this name existed. So this is important. Um, we uh, know from uh, his uh, pre nomen hints, Nefakare Amenemnisu, he we think is the um, Nefakare who appears in. Manetho as Nefakeres. So proving his existence is a, is a, is a good thing, um, a good achievement uh, from the Tanis excavations. My slides are suddenly uh, not working very well. Okay, here we go. Um, in the last minutes that remain, I just want to um, look at the sort of sequence of buildings here, because you, you might already be noticing that there's... Um, some strange inconsistencies in the ways that um, bodies were placed here and there in these tombs. Um, we've already mentioned that Amenemope's sarcophagus was found in the freestanding uh, NRT4, um, but his burial was actually discovered in the event within NRT3, next door to Susenes I, inside the sarcophagus, and that was originally intended for Susenni's wife, Mutnojmet. So it seems Amenemope was meant to be buried here, and then for some reason he ended up inside here. 
don't quite understand um, why. Um, more puzzlingly, and this has really set the conspiracy theorists um, off, um, NRT3, the second of the tombs that Monte entered, um, is decorated for Susenes I of the 21st dynasty, as you will remember. NRT1, the first of the tombs Monte entered, is decorated for Azorcon II of the 22nd dynasty. However, the architecture seems to suggest that NRT3 was built later than NRT1. This is weird um, because it seems as though the first tomb to be constructed contains the burial of a later king, as if they're sort of the wrong way around. Um, we can see this from um, the modification um, that was made to both three and one. So it seems that originally there were two buildings as in the top image here. The second one, um, the second one being this one, second one to be constructed, built not quite aligned with the first one, but on a sort of diagonal, which seems a bit odd. And at a certain point, this tomb was expanded in this direction, which meant that it had to break into NRT1. So this is, uh, this is the original line of NRT1. This is the line as it is now. Um, so NRT1 had to be modified um, to accommodate this tomb. Um, and again, just to, just to emphasize, this tomb is decorated for a 22nd dynasty king, this one for a, a 21st. So the conspiracy theorists um, have, have used this to argue that actually the 21st dynasty didn't come before the 22nd, um, they overlapped with one another and with all kinds of implications for Egyptian chronology. In fact, it seems more likely that what was happening um, was that the 22nd dynasty burials in NRT1 are actually much later than the building's original construction. Um, the, the fact that NRT1 is mostly decorated with ins inscriptions of Azork on the second, um, but that the tomb also incorporates the burial of his father, Tackle of the first, su suggests that Azork on the, the second was in charge and brought his father's burial from somewhere else into the tomb that he was going to use for himself. Um, so it, perhaps he in fact adapted NRT1 for his purposes, it having been built originally for somebody else, somebody earlier than the time of Susenes I. And that can only be one of our two missing early 21st dynasty pharaohs, either Smendes I or Amenemnisu. Both of them are missing. So perhaps this is the sequence of events. First of all, NRT1 is built at the beginning of the 21st dynasty for Smendes I and perhaps for Amenemnisu. Subsequently, another tomb is built next door, NRT3, for Smendes and Amenemnisu's successor, Susenes, and also ultimately for Susenes' successor, Amenemope. But it was extended to accommodate these two chambers here and then had to break into NRT1, as we've seen. Finally, then, NRT1 is rebuilt and repurposed in the 22nd dynasty by Azorkon II um, for his burial and that of his father and one or two others um, unknown. So why did Azorkon II usurp this tomb? Um, perhaps um, we should look to build an argument um, to try and explain this in the apparent gap in the use of the tombs at the end of the 21st dynasty and the beginning of the 22nd. So you'll remember, uh, we don't have the burials of the first two kings of the 22nd dynasty, Shoshenk I and Azorkon I. You will also remember that the last two kings of the 21st, Siamun and Susenis II, although they were present in Tanis, um, were found there in a rather odd situation. Their badly decomposed mummies apparently placed on this plinth, <coughs> excuse me, um, either side of Sheshon 2a. The fact that they were so badly decomposed has led to the suggestion that um, they may have been lying for some time in standing water. That might have um, caused this uh, very bad deterioration. Um, and that, that itself might explain why they were brought here from somewhere else. Perhaps there was a different 
tomb site somewhere else, perhaps nearby at Tanis or perhaps somewhere else entirely, which flooded um, and caused those bodies to be rescued and the Tanis tombs to be um, adapted to accommodate them. Um, the fact that Shosheng 2A with this glorious coffin was also found not in a proper burial chamber, but in an antechamber just placed on a plinth, not inside a sarcophagus, etc. also suggests perhaps that he's been brought in from somewhere else as well. So if there is a, um, oh dear, my um, PowerPoint presentation is doing funny things. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so where might these missing tombs be? If, if there is another site elsewhere, where might this be? Well, we have a canopic chest of Shosheng the first. Here it is, a rather beautiful object made of Egyptian um, alabaster um, in the Neues Museum in Berlin. Unfortunately, um, it was acquired on the antiquities market and we don't know where it was found. We don't have any provenance for it. Um, it this is one example of a, a, a a clear case where provenance would be very, very helpful. Knowing where this came from would be the clue to where the tomb of Sheshonk I is to be found. There is a reference um, also to a house of millions of years of Shoshenk I, which is in Hutkar Tar. And Hutkar Tar uh, it means the Temple of Tar, but it became a name for Memphis. So it, it, it essentially there was a um, a mansion of, million years, of millions of years, a funerary monument of some kind in Memphis. So could it be that at the beginning of the 22nd dynasty, Memphis was revived as the capital of a newly reunited Egypt? And this is where Shoshenk I chose to have himself buried. Could be, could be. In fact, we know that uh, Memphis was being used as a cemetery for members of this this family, if not for certain by the kings themselves, we have this um, rather beautiful uh, tomb, um, beautifully decorated, as you can see on the right hand image here, there's a, an image of um, Prince um, Shoshenk, a high priest of Ptah in Memphis and son of Azork on the second, um, adoring Anubis here. That tomb was found in Memphis, it was dismantled and re-erected um, in the open air museum outside the Egyptian museum, um, in, uh, in the centre of Cairo and Tahrir Square. So there clearly are royal monuments of the 22nd dynasty, royal funerary monuments in Memphis, perhaps an extension of a, a kingly cemetery. Another possibility is that the site of Tel Basta, which we mentioned just a little bit earlier, Bubastis here, centre of the cat goddess, uh, cult centre of the cat goddess, Bastet, um, is significant. Um, among the um, fairly sparse information that the historian Manetho gives us for each of his dynasties um, is, the, uh, is the place of origin um, of the kings um, or their, the seat of their power. It's not qu quite clear how we should interpret it. But in the case of the 22nd dynasty, Manetho um, associates this line with Telbasta. He tells us that this was the seat of their, their authority or their origin. Now, based on the fact that most of those kings at least ultimately came to be buried in Tanis, we'd say it's much more likely that their capital city was there. It was, it was at Tanis, not at Telbasta. But Manetho didn't write this for no reason. And intriguingly, some uh, tantalizing clues emerged at Telbasta just a few years ago. Now, you'll remember that the Tanis tombs were found within the temple enclosure um, a little way off to the right, just outside the main uh, temple entrance. And in a very similar position at Telbasta, this is the entrance way, uh, a badly well, a, a decomposed, but nonetheless still surviving um, entrance um, processional route towards the temple, which is behind us um, as, uh, as we look at this uh, image. In this area, a few years ago, the German-Egyptian mission directed by Dr. Um, Eva Langer, she's now Dr. Eva Langer Athinodoru, I think, um, discovered a number of white faience fragments. Faience is a material that's used for the production of Shabti figurines, of course. White faience fragments um, bearing little parts of uh, the cartouche of a Shoshank Meri Amun. Now, there are a number of Shoshanks 
uh, who were king of Egypt at this time. Some of them we know buried uh, at uh, Tanis, but not all of them accounted for, including Shoshenk I. So this is a very intriguing uh, development. Um, it's not uh, conclusive proof of tombs in this area, but it's very intriguing that they were found in the same equivalent position within the temple enclosure. And these are clearly funerary items. Could it be that there was a royal necropolis at Telbasta, just as uh, there was a royal necropolis at Tanis? So some of these gaps might be plugged by this uh, missing cemetery. Another thing to bear in mind here, and we'll go into this more in, uh, in my next talk about um, uh, untangling the third intermediate period, um, is that Egypt is fragmented for most of the third intermediate period. So we've seen that during the 21st dynasty, Egypt was split between kings in the north and chief priests in the south. We know that by the beginning of the 25th dynasty, um, there were a number of kings and other um, uh, powerful individuals, usually taking the title great chief, uh, who held sway in various different parts of the country. So Egypt was really fragmented at that point, not just split in two, but really fragmented. And the question for scholars is, to what extent um, was that situation of fragmentation the same right the way through the period, or, or were there times when Egypt was unified, as we believe it probably was at the beginning of the 22nd dynasty? The consensus view among most scholars now is that from a few reigns into the 22nd dynasty, after a brief period of reunification, the split happens again. And that there were probably um, not just important individuals in the South, perhaps based in Thebes, but actually kings in Thebes as well. Um, and um, a number of those are listed here. So we have the 22nd dynasty in sort of pink, 23rd dynasty in blue, a, a line of kings based in the south, entirely unknown to Manetho here in this column, and then yet another rival Upper Egyptian line here, again unknown to Manetho. Um, and the burial of at least one of those kings has turned up in Thebes across the water from Karnak in the temple enclosure at Medina Habu. So this is the temple, uh, first pylon of the Temple of Ramesses, the um, third in the background here. This is uh, the um, uh, the Temple of Ramesses, uh, so in the plan on the left, that's the, that's the main pylon here. And again, um, we're, looking, uh, we're looking down at this sort of area here. This is the Temple of Menkepera, um, where the um, strike was staged. And that's the temple here highlighted in red. A little way to the west of that is this um, monument here, which is a tomb. Um, cut into the ground, accessed via a descending staircase, um, which leads to um, a sort of antechamber and then a, uh, a burial chamber um, inside which um, was found the falcon headed sarcophagus of a king, Hedgekepere Setabent Amun Harsiasi, beloved of Amun, probably a contemporary of Azorkon II. Um, if nothing else, the falcon head. Uh, gives away the date. Um, he seems to have been entirely a, a Theban king. So we perhaps need to be looking at even as far south as, uh, as, as Thebes for the location of at least some of the missing tombs of this period. And um, by the way, uh, when I took the photograph on the left, um, the uh, sarcophagus of Hasiezi was still outside the Egyptian Museum on Tahrir Square, but it's subsequently, as you can see from the photo on the right, been packed up and it, um, for transfer to the new Grand Egyptian Museum. Um, where I hope to be able to find it um, at some point. Um, we also know, of course, um, that the gods' wives of Ammon, um, princesses, daughters of pharaohs from the uh, late Libyan period and during the 25th and 26th dynasties, uh, were buried also within the temple precinct, again, echoing the Tani situation at Medina Habu and their, their tomb chapels, which we see here, are very well known. There's also a reference um, in 26th and 27th dynasty papyri, there are several references to a tomb of Azorkon. We don't know which one, um, but most probably Azorkon the third of this Theban line, um, somewhere on the west side of the river at Thebes. Medinet Habu seems the most likely place, um, but it's never been found. 
So just thinking about the significance of the, the Tanny's tombs, um, there are a few key themes, I think, um, for us to have in mind. One of them is this idea that I keep mentioning of the burial within the temple enclosure in the, in the area of the, the entrance to the temple proper. This is characteristic of this period. It's something that we don't encounter before this. And at the time Monte made his discoveries, it would have been a real revelation. Um, we've since encountered more burials um, of this, this kind. And it seems that this was the way of doing things in this uh, new period, possibly uh, a result of um, the need to protect royal burials better done within, within a fortified temple enclosure. Perhaps also something to do with new traditions introduced by the Libyans um, who would come to take over the country um, from at the latest, the beginning of the 22nd dynasty, um, but who were probably influential before that time as well. And this idea of falcon-headed coffins, as, as we've seen, um, appears to be unique to the 22nd dynasty. There are not a lot of examples of it still, full stop, um, but they all seem to concentrate in royal burials of this 22nd dynasty period, albeit um, uh, spread out across more than one royal line. Um, but they're quite characteristic of this, this period. And then, of course, there's the conspicuous use of silver, um, hence the name silver pharaohs. But as we've seen, actually, although there were considerable quantities of silver, there were also very considerable quantities of gold as well. Um, and it's difficult not to um, recall um, the exploits of Pharaoh Shosheng the first, whose burial we don't have, but he was the founder of the 22nd dynasty and, a, and a, the, the unifier of Egypt and also a great military campaigner. He restored to some extent Egypt's empire. And we believe he is one and the same as the Egyptian King Shishak, um, whose um, campaign uh, in uh, the Levant is described in the Bible as follows. So Shishak of Egypt came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Is it possible that some of the precious materials and the wealth that's um, evident in the Tanis tombs came in fact from um, Shosheng's military campaigning around the Levant region, including his conquest of Jerusalem? It's, it's not impossible. Um, it's impossible to prove, um, but it's, um, it's uh, a possibility. Um, that and other um, aspects of the history of the period are what I'm going to cover in, uh, in my next talk. Um, 20th and 21st of July. Um, I don't know why uh, my PowerPoint is going very strange here. So I, I hope you'll join me for that. Um, that'll be the opportunity to, um, to talk a little bit more about this very confused and complicated um, historical background. I hope that will set what we've been hearing about today into, um, into context a bit more. I um, hope to see you then. Um, for now, um, as always, thanks for accommodating me as I overrun and thank you for, for joining me. Thanks for listening. Um, I didn't uh, say at any point um, today that uh, if you have questions, you're very welcome to ask them. I will stick around for a bit. Um, uh, there is a Q&A box, which you will find in the, uh, the menu bar um, of um, your Zoom app, however you're, you're using that. Um, if you pop your questions into the Q&A box, um, I will, uh, I'll try and deal with them there. Um, if there are any questions, um, I'll, I'll deal with those first. Uh, if not, um, I will return to the chat to see if anybody else has any comments or criticisms or questions or whatever there. Um, so a little bit of time for discussion. Um, and, and otherwise, again, um, thanks everybody for coming and, and thanks for, for listening. Um, so, oh, no questions. Oh, wow. I, um, I was just talking to uh, my colleagues on the Imana project the other day. We had a trial run for our fundraising event, um, which is taking place on the 17th of July. That's another thing I'm, uh, I'm going to plug. Um, I am going to be in conversation uh, with Barry Kemp at, uh, at the end of that, um, that talk, as well as putting uh, your questions to him. And um, we, we talked about uh, what questions Barry might like me to ask him. And um, I said, of course, Barry, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, your lecture will be comprehensive and won't um, leave any room for questions or any uh, loose ends untied. 
Um, and I remembered that um, I was at a lecture a few, well, quite a long time ago now, by the eminent uh, Egyptologist and classicist Susan Walker, who at that time, uh, I think, was a keeper of antiquities at the Fitzwilliam Museum. She'd been at the British Museum, Fitzwilliam. She gave a talk about Cleopatra um, arising from the, uh, the Cleopatra exhibition at the British Museum in 2001. And at the end of the talk, which was chaired by dear old Professor Harry Smith, there were no questions, which is which can be a bit awkward. And Harry, Harry just said in his um, in his inimitable way, it seems that Dr. Walker's erudition is such that nobody has any questions. And I thought that was a really <laughs> great way of um, skating around an awkward, potentially awkward moment and paying the lecturer a compliment. So. Um, that's not to suggest that um, my erudition is such that there aren't any questions. And in any case, I see there is one. Um, so, which has stopped me wittering on at least. Thank, thank you, Simon. Um, Simon has a question. Um, do you know, Chris, if any DNA studies have been done on the two mummies found either side of Shoshenk 2A to try and establish relationships, lineage, et cetera? Um, thanks for your talk. It was fabulous. Um, thanks for your kind words, Simon. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, no is the short answer. I. I don't know of any DNA analysis having been done. Um, uh, that makes me want to just go away and double check a couple of sources on that. I don't know even what's happened to those remains. Um, unlike the mummies of the New Kingdom pharaohs, which were recovered mostly from the two caches, which are extremely well preserved, um, and um, and on display in the mummy rooms, or they were in the mummy rooms at the Egyptian Museum. They they went with great ceremony to the National Museum of Egyptian Civilization a few months ago. You probably know um, those have just about all, I think, been uh, DNA tested. I don't know about the Tanis um, human remains, and I don't know where they are. Um, so that that's a very Great question and an intriguing point. Um, I mean, there's some scepticism about um, the DNA research that's been done on the New Kingdom royal mummies and about whether or not it's really possible to get um, reliable results and good DNA from, uh, from remains um, that are that old, even when they're as well preserved as the New Kingdom mummies are. Um, but uh, whether that's even more difficult um, when the bodies are nowhere near as well preserved as they, as unfortunately was the case in the Tannis burials, um, to my knowledge, even even in the tomb of Susenis the first, which was unviolated, Amenemope, which was unviolated, um, Sheshonk two A, which even if it's in a secondary context, was you know the the, the coffin itself seems to have been unviolated. They're just skeletons. And I don't know if that makes it harder um, to get DNA. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I'm not even sure how I'd go about finding this out, but thanks for the question. I'm going to see if I can see what I can find. Thank you. Um, Linda says, it seems odd there are so few early photos of the excavations as photography was so popular then. Do we know if none were taken or if they are just lost? I think, Linda, that there probably are more um and that more were taken um i've only got in fact i'm sure there were more taken um I, i've only got a handful of secondary publications here um at home so when i say for example um uh, that I, I know only know of the, you know this photo or that photo for example of the uh, the situation in the antechamber of nrt3 or the uh, excavation situation um, as the tombs were first um, uncovered, there may well be more than that. I just don't have um, copies of them in my library here. I don't have the excavation, the original excavation reports, for example. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are more. I can't imagine that they don't exist. Um, yeah, that's another thing for me to try and find out. Um, the ones that I, incidentally, the ones that I reproduce here come almost all from, where is it? Um, this exhibition catalogue, uh, Gold of the Pharaohs, 
uh, which accompanied an exhibition of the Tanny's Treasures in the late 80s. It travelled around, it was in Edinburgh um, in the UK and, and various other locations. Um, and this uh, catalogue is quite easily available secondhand online, Gold of the Pharaohs. Um, it annoyingly doesn't really have an author. Um, but if you do a search for Gold of the Pharaohs and you can see a little thumbnail with a, the, um, the Susanne's death mask on the front, that's the book. It, I, I, don't, I don't think it will cost you very much, um, but, but there are a number of archival photographs in there. Most of the ones I use are purloined from there. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's another thing maybe for me to find out. Um, yeah, I have bumped into Francois Leclerc, the excavator, at the site um, on a couple of occasions when um, when I visited in the last few years. Um, he he would be the person to ask. I assume the photos are looked after by the present mission. Um, yeah. Um, so thank you both um, for your questions. Thanks um, again, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look through um, uh, comments. Um, a few people saying they've already booked for the next talk, which is great. Um, thank you so much. Looking forward to seeing you there. Um, oh, Mary says, I know this isn't a question, but there was a facial reconstruction done of Susenis the first for PBS. Is that right, Mary? I didn't know that. Um, I, I suppose what I was um, what I was um, what I'm not sure about is is to what extent those um, human remains have even really been looked at at all, or, or to what extent they're even accessible. Um, uh, you know, some some of the uh, even sort of most important and high profile and most scrutinised human remains are in strange places. You know, the New Kingdom royal mummies, as I say, are on display. So there's no ambiguity about that. There's no doubt about where they are. And, you know, if a person wanted to go along and have a have a good look at the mummy of Ramesses the first, what we believe to be the mummy of Ramesses the first, you can buy a ticket for the Luxor Museum and go and look at it to your heart's content. And the same goes for so many of those other mummies. If you want to go and look at the KV-55 um, mummy, I think you'll find that you're not in luck. Um, you know, for, for example, I, I guess they don't, that, that, that is really just a pile of um, bones, uh, sadly, um, a disarticulated skeleton to put it more scientifically. Um, I and I'm not even sure where those are. Um, and again, yeah, I'm just not sure where the Tannis remains are. It's good to know that PBS were able to do a facial reconstruction because that suggests that they're accessible and, um, for, you know, for the purposes of serious research or reconstruction, this kind of thing, um, which, which would give us all hope that a DNA analysis might be possible. It might, it might even have been done. I, I don't know for sure that it hasn't, but. Um, I, I'm not aware of it having been done. And I think those mummies would have been dealt with in the literature on um, the family relationships, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I don't think they are, but I am going to check that. <laughs> um, thank you, Mary, though. That's, uh, that's very helpful. Um, Oh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, in fact, a comment from Mary as well. Mary says um, that this is an amazing lecture. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, period fascinates me. So be at your next lecture. That's great to hear. Um, would love copies of the slides. I, um, I, have, I have done a previous version of, uh, of this talk and, to, and, and some of the next one, in fact. Um, earlier this year, I, I gave four talks across two weekends for the Kemet Club. Um, which is in Bristol in, in the UK on, online. And um, I posted my slides from those talks and a, a guide to further reading, which is what I, I'm trying to, trying to do as a matter of course after these talks. Um, so if you visit um, my website uh, and hover over the, the lectures menu, you'll find a pop-up with online talks at the top and then uh, the various talks uh, that I've given and covered in um, with a guide to further reading and my slides from those versions of the talks are already up and online um, so uh, yeah m some of uh, some of the slides I, I put up today are are there already um, but I will have a think about creating a, a new page for the new material that's in this uh, talk and the new material that's in the next one um, uh, but yes, if you and if you have any trouble, Mary or anybody else who's interested in finding that page, um, drop me a line via um, my website or via social media, 
um, and I'll point you in the right direction. There's there's a there's um there's good material there, I think. <laughs> Not mine, just pointing you to other people's good material. Uh, and also my slides. Um, Pippa says, thanks, Chris. Um, very clear overview and useful tables. That's great to hear, Pippa. Thank you. Those tables are also on those pages, or uh, the, the main ones anyway, are on those pages. So if anybody wants to have another look at um, those uh, um, uh, chronological charts, uh, those are all accessible via my website as well. Um, yeah, so lots of people saying uh, book for the next talk. That's good to hear. Love Tannis and want to go back, says Linda. Yeah, me too. I can't wait. <laughs> Goodness knows when it will be when, um, when when any of us can next go to Egypt. Um, thanks to everybody for your um, for your your kind words. Um, glad to hear you uh, appreciated it um, so much. Um, Hazel says, speaking as a, a library cataloger, exhibition catalogues without all authors are really annoying. Yep, absolutely agree with you, Hazel. Yep, I used to do uh, all the cataloging for the EES library. And um, yeah, some books are very straightforward, aren't they? And then others are really not. <laughs> it's very annoying. Uh, yeah. Um, books without authors. Oh, come on. Um, Carl says, and thanks for a great talk. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for the use of your photo. You've added so much more since the Chemet Club version. Uh, yeah, great. I'm glad, I'm glad that was apparent. Yes, there is more. Um, Tanis remains one of my favourite Egyptian sites. Um, and I can still recall our excitement being in the empty space that once held the burial of Susenis the first. Yeah, that was amazing, wasn't it, Carl? Um, uh, if any, anybody out there hasn't been to Tanis and gets the chance, I strongly recommend you do it. It's, um, uh, it's not an easy place to get to. Um, in the last few years, well, in fact, every time I've ever been, I think I've always done it from Cairo um and in fact gone to Tanis and back in a day and that's something like an eight hour round trip so it's a long um it's a long old um trip to get there but you go through fascinating uh countryside and lots of um villages with lots of interesting things um to see and the site itself is really um is really amazing and and very few people go so it's um it's always a surprise if and when you ever find that there are any other visitors there at the same time as you uh, and um, and the teams are really uh, the teams are really amazing I'm, I'm really feel really lucky to have been um, when I have especially to get into the tomb of Susenis the first which has only happened that once and it was great wasn't it Carl <laughs> um, Fiona says a new era for me fascinating much to learn look forward to the next one that's great to hear Fiona thanks um, I've been I, I third intermediate period was my um um sort of a specialism which i inherited from my supervisor at the university of birmingham anthony Leahy, who's one of the leading um scholars on the period and in, in fact uh, the leading scholar on the, on the period um for for a time and i'm very grateful uh to 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 have inherited this uh, specialism from him because um it's a period that is a bit neglected um so um I, i'm sure that if i had not had the benefit of his guidance and the opportunity to get uh, um, deeply into the the, um, the period as a student, I'd be really um, probably wanting to avoid it <laughs> because it is very complicated to try and do it off one's own bat is not easy. Um, Mary's posted a link I see to um, the uh, uh, the Nat Geo TV Silver Pharaoh mystery. Um, so it looks like we might be able to. Uh, watch that documentary that would be um, that would be fab thanks very much Mary for that um, and thank you all uh, for, um, uh, for for your questions for your comments for your your kind uh, words thanks again for coming um, uh, as I say um, uh, we'll be back I'll be back on the 20th of July for the third intermediate period um, untangled um, which I hope will be a nice compliment uh, to today another chance to get our teeth into this confused and confusing period the third intermediate period um, until then stay safe and well um hope perhaps to see you before that on the 17th for the amana period and um, study day and fundraiser um it's a great cause i think it's going to be a really great event um your 10 pounds will be absolutely well spent in terms of the quality of the lectures um that are delivered no doubt but um but also 
uh, you can be uh, happy in the knowledge that that money will go directly to um, the continuation of research at Telelamana itself, um, the city of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. So I hope to see you soon. Stay safe and well in the meantime. See you on the 17th or perhaps on the 20th um, or 21st or all of the above. Okay, uh, take care, everyone. See you. See you again soon.